lowest point ever reached by speleological exploration is 2,000 meters below the surface. Only mines, in particular those in South Africa, descend even lower and provide access to the extreme depths. In the Beatrix mine, zoologist Gaetan Bourgogny decided to research the presence of multicellular organisms at a depth of 3,300 meters. His project seemed so far-fetched, it was met with incredulity. Life underground is far more complex than previously. They thought there are some, a few extremophile bacteria and that will be about the size of it and there are some very strange things going on there. But the idea that you would have multicellular complex organisms was completely considered bonkers. Look at all that dirt, man. Look. Water is indispensable to life. Gaetan is therefore looking for the presence of organisms in the mine seepage. So we have a borehole which is valve because there's a lot of pressure behind it, as you have seen. So we attached our equipment here all the way down. And this equipment is specifically to catch anything that is bigger than a bacteria. There's a small filter in here. We want the water here to be exactly as the water was between the rock. And that's why we have this little wheel here, which actually prevents anything from going back up again. This stays like this, flowing for either days, weeks, months, or years. And then we come back, we detach everything, and we go to the lab with this, and we open it under sterile conditions, and then we watch what's inside. The first sample taken by the filter contained nematodes. Little worms whose bodies have no rings. The nematode is a round worm. They are everywhere, from the deepest sea to high in the mountains. They can be from a few hundred micrometers to several meters long. The reason why you find them everywhere is, first of all, they are very adaptable, and also they are very old in evolution. I mean, nematodes are among the oldest multicellular animals that still in existence, and nematodes still have biochemical characteristics that they, is only found back in plants, while they also have genetic characteristics that are only found in bacteria, which confirms that they are quite old in evolution. To find out what these worms could be feeding on at such a depth, Gaetan Bogany visits an old diamond mine, Star Diamond, which opened in the 1900s. Gaetan was left in no doubt. The nematodes draw their food from the very heart of the rock. and he discovered a major clue in the mine, bacterial colonies that accumulate in water flows as white filaments. With an endoscope, he goes further upstream in the tube to find out more about these bacteria. We have a borehole here which goes approximately 30 centimeters straight into the rock and ends up in an open small cavity. We saw these massive blooms of bacteria, which is the very first time anybody has seen this before. And we have then collected a few pieces of these and they contain nematodes. So we have proven that the nematodes actually live within the biofilm and that not only do they live within it, but the biofilm is actually quite big. I mean, it's much more than we ever anticipated before. In all likelihood, the nematodes feed on these bacteria, and it seems that each crack in the rock, even tiny fissures, into which water seeps, constitutes an ecosystem in itself. This challenges the ideas we had of the underground world. If you think about the subsurface, most people think that because of the pressure, there is no space there. Everything is so compressed that there is no room, there are no fractures, but actually exactly the opposite is true. But you don't need a huge place 
to have a lot of life. I mean, think about the size of your thumb. It's enough to have nematodes, bacteria, flatworms, arthropoda, and so on. So it is fractured. It may not be the wide open spaces of Africa, but a thumb is enough to make life flourish. Good nematodes really colonize the smallest available space. Following his intuition, Gaëtan Bogany returned to the Beatrix mine. He took samples from a forming stalactite to study its structure in the laboratory. When you look with a CT scan inside a stalactite, then you actually see that it is not a solid mass of crystals, but it's actually hollow. As you can see very clearly here, there are a lot of hollow spaces where you can easily imagine that nematodes could actually live. And we then cracked one open and looked with the electron microscope, the image you see now, and there you can see on the outer layer, the pink one is the hard layer, the brown is the biofilm, and all the blue ones are actually the nematodes living inside the stalactite. What people do not seem to grasp yet is that studies seem to indicate more and more that if you have a scale and you put all subsurface life on one end and all life on the surface on one end, that the balance actually goes like this, which means there is much more life underneath our feet than there is above on the surface. And that is quite amazing if you come to think of it. So we know that multicellular organisms that live at great depths feed on bacteria. But this throws up other questions. What do the bacteria feed on? How do they colonize the subterranean rocks? Part of the answer lies in Iceland. Here, volcanism is extremely active and geothermal energy has long been harnessed. Deep drilling captures the volcano's hot gases and sends them to the surface where they turn the turbines of power stations. These volcanic gases contain large quantities of carbon dioxide, otherwise known as CO2. To stop it polluting the atmosphere, the Icelandic operators re-inject it into the substratum. They think that the carbon in the gas, under high pressure at depths, will be transformed into carbonate, in other words, into mineral, and will stabilize. For Benedict Menez, geomicrobiologist at the Institut Physique de Globe de Paris and his team, the Icelandic sites are a godsend when it comes to studying underground bacteria the Icelandic experiment is an opportunity to manipulate things on a very large scale with huge quantities of carbon injected, so we'll be able to follow in real time the evolution of these ecosystems and the way in which they react, positively or negatively, to these carbon injections. To find out how the organisms in the Icelandic substrata react to massive injections of CO2, we must drill into the rocks that form the mantle's compact crust. Will we find large numbers of bacteria in the rock cores that drilling will bring to the surface? What will determine the maximum limit for which we'll find life in the depths is the temperature. As there's no life possible after 120 degrees, according to what we know now, 120 degrees in terms of depth is the equivalent of 10 kilometers, depending on the region. Benedict Menez does not aim to reach this limit. She is interested in the zone between four and 500 meters deep where the CO2 was injected. The drill cores are a unique chance to access this microbial life, about which we still know very little. With the high subterranean pressure tamping the rocks, 
the bacteria are forced to take advantage of the smallest micro-cavities to settle and grow. At first glance, Benedict and her team spot a green color that stirs their curiosity. This green and orange biofilm really is everywhere, sometimes with these little white carbonate crystals. And however porous the rock is, even in the most dense zones, this green biofilm fills all the pores, the fractures. And we've had this for 30 meters, since we reached a depth of 410 meters. It's amazing because all this CO2 wouldn't have been converted into mineral, but it would have been assimilated by all the microorganisms to grow, to fill up all the pores in the rock and multiply. The bacteria are indeed extremely numerous, at a depth where food is normally very rare. Their astonishing profusion could therefore result from injecting carbon dioxide into the substratum. To know for certain, Benedict and her team divide the samples and chemically prepare several specimens for closer study. To understand where these bacteria get their food, the scientists have developed a special microscope which, on a microorganism scale, can distinguish organic cells from minerals and thus analyze their interaction. Did you find something in the rock samples we brought back the other day? Yes, I colored them to highlight the microorganisms. These are all small cells that team up with each other and make large bacterial filaments that we see here in green, which are gradually encrusted with minerals. Here and here. The minerals appear in pink and the bacteria chains in green. It'd be interesting to know exactly what they feed on. So they're totally transforming the rock, altering it and creating these new structures. With lots of chemical reactions happening deeper down, it'd be interesting to know whether they're able to develop from all these compounds. The amazing thing is, here they're really feeding on deep fluids, totally independent of what's happening at the surface. The microscope is categorical. There is interaction between the bacteria and the mineral. But this doesn't explain where the bacteria find the organic matter they need to feed on in a compact environment a long way from the surface. Unless, Benedict Menes and her team wonder, is this organic matter produced by the rock itself? These rocks are not supposed to be on the surface of the Earth. So when they're brought into contact with water, they become unstable and transform the water into hydrogen. And the hydrogen, in fact, is the key between the inorganic world and the organic world. The contact between water and the rock produces a chemical reaction that releases hydrogen. This gas combines with carbon, naturally or artificially present in the chinks in the rock. This combination generates complex organic molecules, one of which is methane. And methane is one of bacteria's favorite foods. Bacteria, therefore, can find an abundance of food at the heart of the rocky mantle. We're at the very frontier between mineral and organic. This discovery is an important breakthrough in the understanding of life. Among the molecules produced, we find certain amino acids which make up the building blocks of life. Our body, like all living things on Earth, consists essentially of amino acids and water. The world underground is not the underworld where the shadows of the dead reside, as the ancient Greeks believed. In fact, we now wonder whether it didn't play an active role in the appearance of life on our planet.
The exploration of the depths of the Earth imagined by Jules Verne is only in its infancy. No doubt, it has as many surprises in store as has our exploration of the universe.